Good afternoon. I'm Doug Loud, speaking for O&M Partners, and I want to welcome everyone to this afternoon's Contango Or Town Hall webinar. Contango Or trades under the symbol CTGO on the OTC. After today's broadcast, there will be a Q&A session, and we want everyone to understand that the questions are for everyone. And this broadcast could answer questions you hadn't even thought to ask. I know that happens to me often. The questions can easily be answered by going to the question portal or go to webinar or by emailing us. For any questions that remain unanswered at the end, we will follow up in a timely manner after the call. For those of you who are new to these broadcasts, six years ago or so, actually I think it's seven now, O&M recognized the sea change in the non-deal investment marketing world. Suddenly information is now, as you know, well more available to a whole new generation of investors who couldn't be found in the key financial centers. Investors today are receiving information at home that used to be geared and available only to professional investors. That's why O&M set up the digital footprint and ability to reach out across social media and the web uh, to find its investors. Today we have a very interesting presenter, Rick Van Neuhausen, um, who's the president and CEO of Contango Or. Rick has more than 40 years of experience in the natural resource sector. Before joining Contango Or, he was president and chief executive officer of Trilogy Metals. They're currently developing the high-grade upper Kobik mineral projects located in the Ambler Mining District of Alaska. Trilogy Interestingly, it's a company that was created in 2012 as a spin-out from Nova Gold, a well-known company that founded over 20 years ago. Nova Gold is currently finalizing permits for the 40 million ounce Donlin Gold project in southwest Alaska with a partner Barrett Gold, the world's largest gold company. As you can see, Rick's been around a while and knows what he's doing. Previous to his role as founder, president, and CEO of Nova Gold, Rick held the position of Vice President of Exploration at Placer Dome from 1990 to 97. There's Rick, good to see you. Oh, thanks very much for the introduction. Uh, just uh, checking that everybody uh, can see my screen right now? Yes, yes we can. Perfect, okay, well thanks very much again and uh, we'll uh, love to update uh, uh, investors here. Why is my screen, here we go. So uh, just a, a couple of forward-looking uh, statements, slides. Obviously, I'll be making forward-looking statements and uh, some cautionary language around uh, the use of the term uh, resources, measured, indicated, inferred, um, and uh, non-gap, uh, some non-gap measurements that are uh, that are uh, that we talk about. So uh, with those uh, disclosures, um, I, I just wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, our national debt. Uh, I added this slide to the uh, to the deck here um, because it shows uh, some pretty dramatic increases in our national debt, and we've been talking about this for a while now. But uh, it seems like the more we talk about it, the higher and higher it goes. And uh, of course, when you print more money um, and you create money out of thin air, um, the price of everything goes up. Um, so. Uh, Visual capitalists did a great job of, of uh, showing this visually, uh, what the percentage increase uh, in the amount of uh, amount of dollars in circulation, uh, and this isn't in comparison to GDP, so it's not just uh, the, our, our economy is expanding sort of thing. This is uh, is relative to GDP, so um, this is when you want to be exposed to gold, and uh, um, I, I'm a Firm believer in, uh, in in that gold is uh, the only hard asset currency. Um, I'm, I don't really understand Bitcoin and these things, uh, so I'm, I won't comment on them. But um, I when um, when we see the national debt go up like this, I want to be like this guy here sitting on a pile of gold. Uh, and the way I know how best to do that is uh, is by finding it and by de developing it, by advancing it to uh, to production. And uh, that's exactly what we're going to be doing uh, with uh, Contango, uh, is developing a high-quality uh, ore deposit here in Alaska, so in a, in a safe jurisdiction. So I'll walk you through the presentation and uh, look forward to answering questions. So our gold deposit is the Mancho Gold Deposit. It was formerly known as the Peak Gold Deposit. We've renamed it. 
uh, in, in recognition of the, the Tetlin tribe and the, and, the lands on, and the Tetlin lands on which we work. It's 1.3 million ounces of gold in the measured and indicated categories. Average grade is a little over four grams. Uh, it is located just off the Alaska Highway. And uh, uh, I'll talk about the, uh, what that means in terms of development of the project, um, uh, in, particularly in the context of Alaska, where most things are located in a remote location requiring a lot of infrastructure. Uh, these lands are also private lands that are owned by the Tetland Alaska Native Tribe. We have a business arrangement with them. Uh, we've, had a, we've had a business arrangement with them for well over 10 years now and, and have developed a, a, a good, very good, strong working relationship with the Tetland Tribe. Recently, we uh, uh, formed a business partnership with uh, Kinross to fast track development of our asset uh, using the, the uh, infrastructure, the, the milling facilities and the tailings facilities at the Fort Knox mine, um, which is located just down the highway about uh, 250 miles uh, uh, just outside of Fairbanks here where I'm located. Uh, what this does is allows us to uh, fast track development of our project and minimize uh, the amount of capital because we're not building a mill and we're not building a tailings facility, minimizes our environmental footprint, uh, which obviously minimizes the amount of permitting that we have to do in order to bring this project uh, to fruition. So I'll walk you through all those. And uh, again, we'll have questions at the end of the presentation. So just uh, here's the deposit itself. You can see by the outline of the drill holes, there's two deposits. Uh, we refer to them as the main and the north deposit. Uh, we entered into a 70-30 joint venture agreement with Kinross. Uh, so we formed a new Peak Gold LLC. Uh, our former partner, Royal Gold, uh, retains a royalty in the project. So everybody kind of gets what they, what they wanted. Uh, Kinross gets a majority interest in the project. Uh, we have a 30% uh, participating interest. Uh, we're well cashed up to participate, and I'll, I'll go through some of those numbers a bit later. And of course, Royal Gold as a royalty company ends up with a royalty. So uh, it's a win-win-win deal. Um, as I said, the plan is to truck our ore from the, uh, from the uh, Mancho deposit uh, to the Fort Knox milling complex. Uh, again, it's a simple plan. It's a simple plan to execute. Uh, and we plan to produce about a million ounces, uh, gold equivalent ounces, uh, over the uh, four or five year mine life uh, that we've outlined to date. Capital costs are projected to be in the $110 million range, uh, and we expect operations to tar start in 2024. Uh, our share of production is estimated at a little over 65,000 gold equivalent ounces per year. Uh, guidance is uh, around $750 all in sustaining costs. Uh, I'll just note that, uh, I, as I said in my introduction, uh, introductory remarks, uh, we're printing more money, which usually results in inflation, and uh, uh, apparently it's being called transitory inflation by the Fed right now. Uh, we'll see if that sticks, but uh, we obviously are seeing increasing costs and things like uh, fuel, and uh, uh, we'll see if that translates into higher costs, but obviously we would expect uh, uh, with this higher gold prices. So um, I think they'll, whatever we end up with there will probably uh, be fairly balanced or balance out. Right now we've got an $18 million project uh, or program underway. Actually, we just increased it to 18.7. Uh, we've uh, expanded a little bit of the exploration work and, and some environmental uh, additional monies for environmental studies. Uh, that program uh, is being executed as we speak. Uh, we're just about wrapping up all of the uh, exploration and infill work and mainly now working on preparing for uh, uh, submission of our formal permitting application uh, before the end of the year. We plan to do a feasibility study in 2022 uh, with uh, probably some early stage construction activity starting in 2022 uh, in the summertime. Uh, and uh, the, but the main construction year being 2023 with production then in early 2024. Uh, obviously, we'll continue to explore uh, this very large land package, which I'll uh, describe a bit more uh, in further detail. But uh, it's about 850,000 acres in the heart of the Tintina Gold Belt. Uh, so very exciting area to be uh, developing a mine in uh, in uh, central Alaska. Just a bit about the 
the company. Uh, we recently uh, finalized a strategic investment by the Alaska Future Fund uh, of $10 million. Uh, I also participated in the financing, uh, contributed $1 million. So uh, I'm, I'm putting my money where my mouth is, so to speak. Um, the just a bit of a comment on who the Alaska Future Fund is. It's a joint venture between Bearings, which is a very large uh, fund, uh, manages about $320 billion uh, worldwide, uh, and the uh, Alaska uh, Permanent Fund Corporation, which is uh, an Alaska, uh, is the owner of the Alaska uh, Permanent Fund. This is, uh, I think it's about an $80 billion fund right now, and the Alaska Future Fund is a subset of that uh, of the, the Alaska um, uh, the Alaska Permanent Fund Corporation uh, intent on investing in Alaska, and so we are we are uh, the first investment that they've made in Alaska. Uh, so it's a pretty um, uh, pretty standout uh, honor to be the the first company that they've invested in, <laughs> and of course um, they have a substantial. Uh, fund behind that, so we'll uh, uh, we'll certainly look to them uh, as a strategic partner uh, going forward in developing not only the Mancho deposit but other uh, other projects here in Alaska. Uh, we definitely have uh, sufficient capital to to meet our uh, all of our all of our needs from a uh, uh, cash uh, standpoint. Uh, we're well cashed up. Um, we have about thirty six million dollars in cash right now. Uh, no warrants, no debt, and uh, still a very small number of shares outstanding, 6.6 .6 million shares outstanding, uh, another $100,000 100, uh, warrants, or sorry, um, options, uh, makes that 6.77 and uh, fully diluted. Um, you can see our ownership structure, uh, institutional, 45%, 35 retail, and about 20 um, yeah, insiders. Uh, so we're, we definitely have skin in the game, so to speak. Um, just a couple of uh, sort of highlights on uh, the Mancho deposit itself and the economics. Um, because we're using uh, existing infrastructure, um, this allows us, and this is the existing infrastructure at Fort Knox, this allows us to get to production much quicker than if we were uh, building our own mill and tailings facility. Uh, this allows us to, again, sort of fast track this project uh, through uh, for, for production in 2024. Um, uh, we, we're still expecting about $110 million of capital, uh, a million ounces of gold production, gold equivalent uh, production a year. This is mostly a gold mine. There's a little bit of silver, but uh, it is mostly uh, mostly gold. Uh, there is copper in the ore, but it, we don't plan to recover any, any of the copper. Um, we'll produce a little over uh, 220,000 ounces uh, per year, uh, with Contango share being a little over 65 million ounces. Um, so uh, average grade uh, is about uh, six grams per ton, and that should actually be gold equivalent. Um, and again, guidance on cost is somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, $750 uh, per ounce. Um, we have uh, only started to be, uh, explore the real deposit here. I'll, I'll, I'll speak to that in a bit more detail later, but we have a very huge land package uh, on the Tetlin lease. Uh, it's about 675,000 acres. So uh, right now we're only working on, a, on less than uh, 100 acres. So uh, we have a lot of exploration work to do here. Um, just to give you a, an idea of our, our all-in sustaining costs, where that fits on the overall uh, global uh, all-in sustaining cost curve, uh, we're down, down in the lower third or towards the lower third of, of cash costs, uh, sorry, of, of all-in sustaining cash costs. So um, uh, good, good, high quality mine. Uh, again, we have you know four to six grams per ton. Uh, you're, uh, you've got a high quality deposit here. This is a photo that shows you know why the infrastructure is working for us. This is the Alaska Highway. It's a paved highway. You can see just behind the bushes, uh, the hills in the back. That's where the peak uh, or Mancho Gold deposit is located. Uh, the map there shows that the uh, the distance uh, on the Alaska Highway. Uh, up to Fairbanks and on over to Fort Knox. Uh, we're about 250 miles away from the Fort Knox milling uh, facility. 
So uh, just a bit on Alaska and the Tintina Gold Belt. Um, a lot of gold here. Um, just uh, has a, Alaska has a rich uh, mining history. It's the second largest gold producing state in the United States. There's six, act, six active mines um, uh, uh, throughout, this, throughout the state. Um, good stable uh, regulatory environment, uh, stable taxes. There's about uh, 4,600 direct jobs in mining and 94 indirect, 9,400 uh, indirect jobs. Contributes to uh, local governments, to the state government, uh, as well as uh, to Alaska Native corporations. And of course, our, our business arrangement is with the Tetlin tribe. Uh, so they'll see a, a, a huge benefit uh, from the development of this mine as well. Uh, it's a big part of uh, Alaska's export economy. and. Uh, we see a lot of exploration continuing. Uh, the last statistics uh, were for 2019, 162 million. Last year was a slow year, slower year just because of the COVID. Uh, we're seeing uh, uh, that kind of come back in spades this year. We're uh, expecting uh, probably close to $200 million in expenditures this year uh, statewide on exploration um, with, an additional amount, with additional amount spent uh, for mine development, of course. So the Tantina Gold Belt is this arc of uh, uh, that uh, corresponds to a geological terrain uh, in the Yukon and Alaska. Uh, a lot of gold deposits located along this. Uh, our neighbors, uh, Pogo, uh, True North, uh, the Dolphin Project, Brian Lode, uh, all the way out to continue the belt out towards Donlin. Of course, the 40 million ounce gold deposit at Donlin that we were uh, instrumental in uh, in discovering. Um, but uh, certainly a lot of exploration uh, to go on throughout this belt. Uh, we see a huge amount of activity currently. Um, I won't go into any details on the geology here, but uh, I just wanted to say that uh, the Mancho deposit is a SCARN type deposit associated with these uh, uh, quartz muscovite schists and the calcareous horizons within the schist. There are uh, limestone beds Within the within the schist unit that makes up the, the Yukon Tanana terrain, and it's those uh, scarnified bodies that contain the gold. Uh, so you need a number of things to actually make uh, the gold deposit at peak. You need to have the original calcareous or limestone uh, host rocks. They need to be scarnified, and then you need structures to go through those scarns uh, with the addition of uh, sulfides. Uh, for the gold to precipitate out. So that's those are the four sort of ingredients you need to create a good high quality gold deposit at peak gold. And uh, we found already already over uh, well over a million ounces. And uh, there's no doubt in my mind that we'll find more with additional exploration. So our joint venture with uh, uh, with Ken Ross is set up this way. The it's it's through the Peak Gold uh, joint, uh, joint venture company uh, that pertains to the Tetlin lease. Uh, that is in the uh, in the joint venture, uh, along with the lands outlined in the blue there. Uh, those are state mining claims uh, that uh, were also contributed to the joint venture. Um, outside of those, the other pink lands, uh, those are state claims that uh, uh, Contango retains on a 100% basis. There's roughly 170,000 acres there that we retain on 107 uh, on 100% <coughs> excuse me 100% basis. You can also see the the, the Tetlin lease covers about 675,000 acres. Um, I think they're outlined in blue. There's another 13,000, so call it 190,000 acres plus or minus. Lots of other prospective um, uh, areas outlined uh, that we have not yet gotten to. Uh, all of the work has really been done, uh, or lion's share of the work has been done inside that circle there. Uh, that's where most of the money is, most of the dollars have been spent outlining the peak gold deposit itself. Uh, so again, the, the, the joint venture pertains to the yellow lands and that little area outlined in blue there. Um, and then the rest of the uh, rest of the state mining claims are owned 100 percent by Contango Ore. Uh, this is the uh, official uh, 40, uh, 43101 uh, issued by uh, Kinross, their Canadian uh, listed company. Uh, we uh, filed our own uh, parallel report uh, according to uh, U.S. Uh, regulatory uh, requirements, uh, SK-1300 uh, report. So uh, they're, they're the same. There's no difference. It's the same QP, in fact. 
uh, they're just uh, uh, they follow the, uh, the, uh, the, the the two different uh, Canadian and U.S. Uh, uh, filing uh, requirements. The one difference you'll see is that uh, in the United States, um, for some reason, I don't actually agree with this, but they want us to show what 30% of the deposit actually looks like in terms of tons and grades. So uh, that's the only difference between the two, uh, the 43101 and SK 1300. But uh, uh, it's easier to understand it on a 100% basis and then just you know take 30% of the proceeds. But um, uh, anyways, they're uh, they're labeled here uh, in in both formats, so you can see them. So again, the the whole reason this uh, this project really works uh, well for our shareholders and is a huge benefit for our shareholders is because we don't have to build a mill and a tailings facility. We're going to mine the ore at, at, at the peak gold deposit. Uh, we're going to truck the ore up to the uh, existing mill that has been operating for 25 years uh, at Fort Knox um, and uh, process the ore through the, the mill and then put the tailings into the tailings facility that's also been operating for 25 years. So. You know, no no ramp up uh, issues, no um, no permitting issues. We don't have to permit a mill. We don't have to permit a tailings facility. Nor do we have to capitalize uh, uh, the company uh, at a huge expense uh, to build our own mill. Uh, in rough numbers, if we did build our own mill, we'd probably be in the three hundred and fifty million dollar range uh, for capital to do that. Just to put a just to put a perspective on that. So. Um, you know our costs uh, all in um, capital in terms uh, uh, in capital terms are going to be about 110 million dollars. So um, I just want to spend a little bit of time on the on the geology and the, the exploration opportunity here. Uh, you can see the two ore bodies there uh, outlined in plan view on the on the upper diagram. Uh, the north deposit on the uh, on the on the right side and the main deposit on the uh, on the left side. The two deposits actually dip towards each other, uh, and so when when you do the infill drilling of that, you want to cut that uh, uh, that ore body as uh, as uh, as close to a right angle as you can, and so that's why you see the drill holes drilling away from each other, which really leaves the middle uh, under drilled. Um, so that's one of the areas that we're drilling this summer. Uh, that program, as I said, is ongoing right now. Um, it's actually been uh, expanded to $18.7 million uh, that the joint venture has decided to uh, to spend. And uh, we're certainly on track and on budget to uh, execute that program. We'll plan to have a uh, an updated resource at the end of that, probably sometime in Q4 of this year, uh, once all the assays are, uh, are in and then bid QAQC'd, uh, we'll be updating the resource model. Um, and this is mostly, again, infill drilling, so it's mostly uh, indicated inferred, uh, moving up into the higher measured and indicated categories. Uh, we will be doing some exploration. Uh, one of the areas uh, is, is drilling between the, the two deposits here in more detail. And of course, if we add some resources, uh, they'll augment the, uh, the existing 1.3 million ounce resource. <clears throat> but this is all uh, part of the plan to uh, not only get the infill drilling done, but the, uh, the environmental permitting uh, work to be able to submit our permit application uh, later this year, probably in Q4, um, and, uh, and then be able to get things lined up to start construction in 2022, 23, uh, with production starting in 2024. We've initiated dialogue with all the communities along the, uh, the haulage route, along the Alaska Highway. Um, and of course, we uh, have regular updates with the Tetlin tribe who uh, strongly support the project. They'll receive, I just mentioned this, they'll receive a royalty. Um, uh, they've received already advanced royalty payments, but uh, they'll uh, we'll receive uh, royalty payments uh, when we're in production. And of course, uh, we'll have access to uh, jobs, job training uh, through the programs that we've initiated and, and have executed over the last 10 years. Uh, this uh, this uh, diagram just shows where the infill drilling and the geotechnical and metallurgical drilling have taken place along with the hydrology. Uh, typical you know, feasibility level uh, program, lots of infill drilling, um, hydrology, and pit geotechnical, uh, geotechnical studies for the placement of the waste facilities and, uh, and uh, uh, the truck shop. That's, uh, that's essentially the biggest building we're going to build is a truck shop. 
this program uh, started over the winter. Um, we are set up for winter drilling here, and uh, so um, it's it's a lot nicer weather out right now. It's uh, it's about 70 degrees out, and uh, we're taking advantage of as much of the summer program as we can accomplish. Um, we're well set up to handle all the core. This is the facilities that we've been operating for 10 years. Uh, lots of local employment. Uh, we've uh, worked closely with the Tetlin tribe over the last 10 years um, and will of course continue to do. I'm, I'm very impressed with King Ross's uh, public outreach to the communities as well as their engagement with the Tetlin tribe. So I, I think we're on track uh, there as well. Um, so let's just put this in perspective. Um, this map here shows the Fort Knox uh, mine site in the little little uh, uh, brown colored box there, or brown colored circle. The blue area is the complete Fort Knox land package of 58,000 acres. Uh, and when you compare that to the Tetlin lease of 675,000 acres and uh, where we're located at the, uh, the Mancho deposit there, you can see that there's um, uh, a lot of exploration potential on the uh, on the Tetlin lease. Um, we'll focus in right in and around the main and, and north deposits. Uh, you can see a, a number of names here. These all coordinate with uh, specific targets that have been identified with a, a huge database of geochemistry and geophysics uh, that have been uh, uh, taken uh, been completed over the the last ten years uh, by. Um, by Contango and its former partner, uh, Royal Gold. Um, this is the geochem. Uh, it's the best indicator of gold mineralization is the gold in the soils. Um, you can see the outline of the North Peak and Peak deposits here. They, they form sort of two trends that seem to coalesce as you go further downhill towards uh, the river. Uh, this is the Toke River here. Um, obviously, as you go downhill, you get more uh, surficial material, so the, the, the geochem anomaly becomes uh, more, more, more dilute. Uh, but you can see that it continues uh, along with uh, geophysical signature as well. So we'll continue to drill on that trend as well as drill these other trends uh, that have received far less attention over at North Saddle. There's a big anomaly there. And then uh, the other one is the discovery uh, trend. Uh, which is slightly uh, slightly different orientation, uh, but uh, uh, also a very strong geochemical trend that needs to be followed up on. So that'll be the focus of some of the uh, exploration work that we do this year, uh, which uh, we're, is underway right now, and uh, we'll uh, uh, be reporting on any uh, drill results that we have out of that uh, probably later in the third quarter, third fourth quarter of this year. Thanks. Um, and then beyond that, uh, we have our own 100% owned claims at Triple Z, uh, the Eagle Dome area, and the Hona uh, Prospect. Uh, these are 100% owned by uh, Contango, and uh, we're actually active on our exploration program right now. Um, uh, we'll start up at uh, Eagle here in another couple of weeks. Uh, we're currently working up at Shamrock, uh, which I'll just mention here briefly. Uh, before I do that, though, just uh, the Triple Z prospect, uh, copper gold porphyry, um, classic porphyry signature, um, maglet, magnetic low due to the, the, the alteration and destruction of magnetite, uh, coincident with gold and, and silver, uh, sorry, gold, silver, and copper in the uh, soils, um, and a resistivity high. That's a absolutely classic porphyry signature. Um, we've done IP, a 3D. Uh, pseudo section to the IP survey. Uh, and we have got a, a great target here uh, to drill. Unfortunately, it's on land that uh, is uh, currently uh, being transferred from the federal government to the state government. Uh, we're hoping that that transfer will be done before the end of the year. Uh, I doubt we'll be able to get it done in time to drill this year, unfortunately, but hopefully next year we'll be in a position to drill this, uh, uh, this wonderful target. You can see we drilled on the land that uh, on the on sort of the edge of the target uh, on the land that has not, uh, that had already been transferred. Um, and you see we have low, uh, low grade uh, copper and gold. Uh, again, we're, we're drilling periphery to what we know is the main target. So we'll look forward to updating on that when we get, uh, when the land transfer is done and we can get drills, uh, drills on site here. Over at Hona, uh, we've got three nice targets outlined there. 
uh, with geochem and geophysics, and uh, uh, we'll we'll uh, get to do some more work on that this summer. Um, and then the other, the third area is this uh, eagle prospect, and we can um, see we've got a whole series of anomalies. Uh, that are stream sediment and pan concentrated anomalies for around six kilometers of strike length along the Eagle block there. And it, this was done at the same time that the, uh, this uh, uh, stream sediment and, uh, and uh, pan concentrate sampling was done at peak. And you can see the scale of the peak anomaly on the inset map there. It's a nice, you know, peak shows up as a nice, uh, nice big anomaly. Uh, but when you compare that to Eagle, uh, there's just a lot more anomalism associated with the Eagle prospect. So we're going to get boots on the ground here in a couple of weeks and uh, look forward to uh, updating on what we find this summer. Uh, we have not been back to Eagle since we did the original survey. Um, they just always, uh, always seem to uh, find more uh, dollars to spend at peak with additional drilling and the success that they had there. So I'm, I'm excited to get myself uh, boots on the ground here this summer. And uh, as I said, we'll be going up later in July uh, to start our field investigations there as well. Uh, the last project, we just acquired this uh, through staking. Uh, we staked 668 state mining claims over the Shamrock Prospect. Uh, again, it's right off of the road. Uh, it's actually situated between the Alaska Highway and uh, the, um, the Alaska Pipeline. Um, so, because of that, we've got tremendously good access across the entire claim block. Uh, there's roads that crisscross the thing, uh, accessing the pipeline, and, and so we can pretty much get all around the prospect itself. Um, this area uh, is uh, it's close to Pogo. Uh, Pogo mined about 175,000 ounces in 2020. Uh, I think they're looking to a similar year of uh, production this year. Um, the Shamrock area has been uh, only an alluvial gold producer. Uh, a little bit of, um, uh, of some hard rock gold was uh, prospected, but not mined. Uh, there's been about 120,000 ounces of alluvial production uh, from the area. Um, we're just in the final uh, finalizing an acquisition agreement uh, with Core for their database, uh, Core Mining. Uh, they formerly um, had a, uh, purchased a company that had had uh, prior claims here, but uh, uh, but they've been dropped. But Core has the database, and we're in the process of getting that extensive geochemical and geophysical database from them. So uh, that'll certainly uh, sort of jumpstart our uh, our exploration program there this summer, which is actually underway right now. Um, a lot of geochem data, as I mentioned, uh, so we'll get all this data in the geophysics as well, uh, and put uh, uh, put that into our uh, uh, our plan uh, for exploration uh, this summer, which is, as I mentioned, already underway. Main task at hand, though, is, uh, is back to peak, uh, the Mancho deposit, and, and getting this uh, moving along, uh, continuing it, it to move along the, the, the plan here, which is the drilling this summer, the feasibility study next year, finalizing permitting. Uh, we see the permitting application going in later this year. And uh, we're expecting a, a, a 12 to 18 month process for, uh, for permits. Again, we're not permitting very much here. Um, we need a 404 permit to upgrade the access road into, uh, into the deposit area. Um, yeah, part of that road goes across wetlands and so you need a wetlands for what they call a dredge and fill permit for uh, doing activities in, uh, in wetlands. Uh, that's issued by the uh, United States Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, that process is uh, the dialogue and, and that process is, is underway, but we have not yet submitted formal uh, application, which we again plan to do probably in the in the fourth quarter of this year. A um, lot of community engagement, of course, as I mentioned, construction will probably start on some of the early works in 2022. Uh, and uh, and then, uh, but the main construction year will be 2023, but uh, in time for us to have a startup in 2024. Um, pretty fast time frame for developing a new mine. So uh, I'll leave you with uh, with this slide. Um, we're a 30% owner in a high quality deposit off the road system in Alaska uh, that allows us to fast track this deposit towards production. Uh, for Contango shareholders, that's a little over 65,000 ounces of gold equivalent production per year starting in 2024. 
uh, cash costs in the neighborhood of $750 uh, per ounce. Um, and uh, so you can tell what that does to, uh, to our, uh, uh, our margin. Um, I'm sort of envisioning a 17, 1750 long-term goal price. Um, and so if you use those metrics, that's a thousand dollar margin per ounce. Uh, we have uh, 6.7 million shares outstanding. If you do the quick math, that's uh, you know, $10 of free cash flow per share. So um, that's extraordinary for a company our size. Um, we, we do plan to have other exploration going on. Uh, certainly we'll explore, continue to explore the Rancho deposit and the Tetlin lease, but also our 100% owned lands uh, right along the, uh, uh, the corridor to, uh, uh, to Fort Knox. And of course, if we're successful, we'll, uh, we'll either have another discussion with our, our friends at Kinross, or we can maybe develop our own mine if, uh, if the grades aren't sufficient to truck to the Fort Knox mill. Uh, but certainly where we're starting with, with Mancho, uh, we see this as an optimal way to, to get fast track production and cash flow to our shareholders. I'll stop there and uh, we can talk about, um, uh, take up the Q&A. Great, Rick. I mean, that's just absolutely fascinating and really, really very interesting. Um, before I call on some of the panelists, I did have two quick little questions. Um, you talk about the 250-mile drive to Fairbanks to the mill. Is that through hills? Is that flat road, straight shot? What kind of a drive is that? Uh, it's a, it's a, a drive on the Alaska Highway. So um, it's a, you know, it's a highway that's been in existence uh, since, the, uh, since the 40s. Um, it's paved the whole way. Uh, there's pull-out lanes um, uh, for passing on the, on the hills, uh, so it's you know it's a pretty well established highway. Um, it's uh, it is 250 miles is a fair distance, uh, but we have high grade ore. So we're, basically, when you translate this to grade, uh, it costs us about 1.3 ounces, uh, 1.3 ounces per ton grade uh, to truck the ore up to the mill. Uh, you know, if you do the rough math, it's in the, you know, in the neighborhood of $60, $70 per ounce. Or, right. sorry, per, um, but then you don't have to build your own mill, so that's great. That's exactly, that's the offset. I mean, obviously, you're going to have uh, higher operating costs uh, in with the trucking, um, you know, $60, $70 per ton, but you don't have to build your own mill. You don't have to capitalize that. You don't have to permit that, and you don't have all the startup issues that mills typically do. I mean, I don't know how many stories... <laughs> I've heard of a junior mining company X saying, oh, we're going to put this project into production and they start the mill up and it doesn't work and uh, this doesn't work and that doesn't work. And, um, you know, so we just don't have that. Uh, that's not part of the uh, part of the startup issues uh, that we'll be facing as a, as a junior company. And of course, with Kinross having operated the mill for 25 years in Alaska, um, they're well established here in Alaska, they're well respected here in Alaska, so we couldn't really ask for a better partner. That's great. One other quick question: when when you get into production on um, Mancho and you're getting your 30% royalty, as it were, that gives you an awful lot of money to do other things. Do you effectively then, in my opinion, become a self-financed exploration company for all that other wonderful property you have? Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's, there's different things we can do with that cash flow. We uh, we might decide uh, 65 million dollars uh, a year would be a um, a heck of a, an exploration budget. So uh, I could see us maybe dividending half of that and spending half of it on exploration to uh, find more or or either at Mancho or on our other prospects. Um, as I said. Uh, We've got 100% control of a pretty big block of ground right around Tetlam. Uh, I'm pretty excited to get boots on the ground at Eagle. Um, <clears throat> that's a pretty strong yeah. uh, stream sediment and, and pancon anomaly for six kilometers long strike immediately on trend and north of the peak gold deposit. So, um, or sorry, Mancho uh, gold deposit. So, yeah, I mean, there's, uh, I, I, I could certainly uh, see us dividending uh, some of the cash and uh, and spending uh, some of the cash flow to uh, to find more uh, more gold deposits. That's great. Okay, let me talk to some of our panelists. Uh, Mike Ward, are you able to have a question and unmute?
I just barely. I'll turn my speaker up too. Is that better? Okay. Yeah. Well, so, yeah. Um, can you give us a current update where the Royal Gold, uh, the royalty stands today? Because I know they have some options and commitments. Uh, or, or potential future commitments, some variables there. Second, your 30% interest, is that pre or post the royalty? And then the third part of the question is a uh, addition to Doug's uh, uh, hauling. Um, can you go into a bit more detail about the long haul operation, what you're gonna use? Cause I imagine you're not gonna use your large cat uh, trucks. It's gonna have to be over the road, uh, some some form. Can you? Discuss what that is, and um, the the last piece of that, the 750 per ounce. Assuming uh, it's 50, 60 a ton, does that mean you're less than 700 to mine it? 50, 60 to transport it, that gets you to the 750. So six, seven percent is the cost of transportation. So I guess that turned into four parts. <laughs> no question. So let me let me answer the um, uh, the the. the truck traffic, uh, highway traffic questions first. So um, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. We're not gonna use the mine trucks to, to haul ore up to the uh, Fort Knox mill. These are just the standard uh, road trucks. Uh, we have decided to use both, uh, 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 to use a, a truck and trailer combination so that uh, there'll be less truck traffic. Uh, the trucks will be, will be bigger uh, uh, in terms of what's being hauled, uh, but that'll reduce the, uh, the number of trucks uh, and that's you know that's come out of some of the dialogue with the communities um, uh, is you know trying to reduce the, uh, the amount of trucks and obviously there's a, an economic element to that as well if you can haul more ore with a truck you're uh, you're getting uh, your costs down as, as low as you can so um, but this is a, again strict highway fleet we are planning on this uh, being uh, contracted out I mean uh, there are lots of companies in Alaska who haul freight. Um, and they're much better at it than I think uh, a mining company would be. So we, we, we certainly see taking advantage of the existing uh, uh, long haul truckers uh, groups that are been operating in the state for many, many, many years. So um, we do see that as a contracted uh, uh, cost center. Um, and to, to, I guess to get back to your question on costs, um, uh, the, uh, the all-in sustaining cost includes the transportation cost. So that estimate of $750 um, uh, per ounce, and just to make sure we get the metrics right there, uh, that's correct. That's, uh, that's as, uh, as an update number as we have. And as I will caution you from a forward-looking st uh, statement standpoint, I expect those costs to go up because you know we're issuing trillions of dollars of of new debt every time you turn around and, and uh, Biden gets his hand on a pen. So um, I don't, I expect that number to go up. We won't really have an update on that until we complete a feasibility study and, and know what we're looking at uh, in 2022, uh, 20, 2022, 23. On the flip side, I also don't expect the gold price uh, to be, you know, uh, I think uh, 1250 was the gold price that Ken Ross uh, was using long term when they gave that guidance. So um, you know, if if we're going to see higher costs, we'll likely see a higher gold price. I don't mean higher than we have today. I mean higher than was used when when this comparison was done, uh, which was 1250. So um, I mean, obviously today we have you know 1800 dollar gold price. Um, uh, uh, you know, I can comment on what I think gold prices will be, but all I'm saying is that. Uh, if you're uh, if you're going to be uh, uh, in an inflationary environment, uh, I expect the cost to go up. I also expect the gold price to go up. So I think they'll stay in tandem. Um, now, your other part of your question on royalties uh, with Royal Gold, uh, they just have a royalty that runs with the land. Um, it's a three percent royalty, and uh, it's uh, it applies to uh, the lease. And it also applies to our 100% owned lands. That was part of our agreement with Royal Gold when we uh, brought in Kinross. It was, it was sort of a three-way transaction, if you will. We, we wanted Royal Gold uh, to, you know, in order for them to get what they wanted, they wanted royalty. So they have a 3% royalty in the property and they have a 3% royalty in our 100% owned exploration lands um, around 
uh, around the uh, the original exploration land. So that's that's the Triple Z, um, the Eagle, and the Hona prospects. It does not cover Shamrock. Uh, Shamrock we state later, and and that's uh, it's well outside the area of interest. Uh, there's uh, you, you mentioned something about some other commitments that Kin, uh, that uh, Royal Gold has to for their royalty. There aren't any. Uh, the only other uh, part of the royalty of uh, the royalty piece of the transaction was that uh, um, Kinross uh, gave uh, Royal Gold a uh, an extra silver royalty that they contributed uh, to uh, to Royal Gold. And uh, we were compensated for that up front. Um, so uh, it actually is, uh, but it is a, a, a silver, uh, in addition to the gold royalty, there's a silver royalty as well. Uh, it's 25% of the silver. Now, that sounds like a lot of silver, but um, when you factor in the fact that uh, we don't actually have a silver circuit at uh, Kinross's Fort Knox operation, it's just the gold that reports, sorry, it's just the silver that reports to the, uh, to the doorway that gets pour, poured in the bar there at Fort Knox. Now it's not, you know, it's not insignificant, but it's uh, um, it's not a huge uh, 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 cost contributor to uh, uh, from a royalty standpoint. If that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. You bet. Now, there's the silver would help credit be a credit against your costs. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. If you're looking at uh, cash cost again, all this is kind of wrapped up in that all-in sustaining cash cost. That's uh, that's mm -hmm. the whole purpose of having all using all-in sustaining rather than just cash cost. Um, so that you know royalties are included uh, in that all-in sustaining cash cost projection of 750. Again, I expect that to go up, but I also expect the gold price to go up. Okay. Uh, Rick Waiters, do you have any questions today? Can you unmute yourself? Sure, or thanks. I've got a, a couple of points of uh, clarification, Rick, if you would. Uh, first, uh, Doug described uh, Contango as a royalty. It's not that, right? It's it's a participating in joint venture. So you will incur your 30% of the costs as those costs go up or down, depending upon the how the uh, operation's managed, correct? Absolutely. Yeah, this is, yeah, we are not a royalty company. I'd say we're not too different from a royalty company. Um, you know, royalty companies like to uh, market themselves as not being exposed to risk at the operations level. I'd say they're exposed to the risks; they just don't have any control over them. Um, so, in that regard, I think we're, we're, we're we'll be we'll, we'll, we will be quite similar to a royalty company. Um, yeah, no, I, I like that answer, and I also like the recognition that you will have uh, decision making. Um, uh, on on the um, on the operating committee, huh? So that's important. Uh, another point of clarification, and this is just for everybody, because I think uh, it's important for people to have the numbers 1.3 grams per ton, not 1.3 ounces per ton for transportation, right? Uh, just for everybody, I, I you uh, you said ounces, but you meant grams. Um, yeah, sir. If I said ounces, uh, yeah, it's it's in terms of the cost, in terms of yeah. our grade, our average grade uh, that will be trucking will be six grams. Gold equivalent, right? Uh, which works out about just 75 bucks a ton, as you said. My question uh, on transportation would be this: um, It is a long way, um, you know. Gold at the beginning of the year uh, isn't a whole lot different than was now, uh, you know, it is now. Um, but my gas prices are over 50 percent higher. My question would be, uh, with respect to transportation. Uh, do you again uh, have input on how that cost may be treated by the joint venture and by Ken Ross's operator in terms of what what hedging you may do uh, for fuel in, in respect of that cost, which is really going to be 50 to 60 percent of your total cost? Um, in terms of, I think your question, are, do, are we in control of that? Um, I, again, the way we see this operating is to hire a contractor uh, to do the trucking. So, you know, we'll enter into a, a, a long-term contract. Uh, what fuel prices, I mean, obviously we'll be exposed to fuel price increases. Um, this estimate was done um, uh, in 2019. So fuel prices were actually pretty similar to where they are now. Uh, they went down, then and now they've gone back up. 
Um, yeah. They're probably yeah. slightly lower than when they did the uh, the, the estimate. Uh, so I, I don't think in that context, I don't think things have changed from 2019. I think we're you know plus or minus kind of back where we were sort of pre-COVID, if you will. Um, going forward, um, you know, one can always uh, uh, hedge fuel. Uh, again, this will be operated through a uh, with a contract with a, uh, a trucking uh, company. So that's something that might be addressed in there. A lot of the trucking companies here actually are also fuel companies because that's one of the main things fuel. Uh, so uh, that that discussion will probably be part of the overall uh, contract discussion with uh, with the, our chosen operator, which we haven't chosen yet. But uh, there's probably yeah, half sure. a dozen that can uh, can sort of fulfill that role here in Alaska. So, so you've got you've got multiple an avenues to uh, to manage that uh, that price uh, risk huh? in terms of the fuel. Uh, but you know, bottom line, is, bottom line, it is a price risk. It's a price risk mm -hmm. for the entire mining industry. If you know, exactly. costs go up. In fact, there's been lots of art recent articles talking about uh, you know what's going on or what's not going on in Saudi Arabia and uh, in Dubai. So um, we'll we'll see how that plays out. But you know, generally, when you see fuel prices increase, yeah, the costs of production go up, but it's usually in line with other. Uh, other commodity prices that uh, also start to uh, appreciate in value. So like all the hard assets. No, I have just uh, two quick things and I'll add them together. Uh, uh, you you mentioned uh, the deposit geology and you meant uh, is the SCARN and you mentioned copper. Uh, first question, uh, I suppose uh, for a 38,000 ton a day plant like Fort Knox, it's really dilutions, the solution pollution. So uh, have there been any issues at all uh, uh, can, uh, or or uh, anything to consider in terms of uh, metallurgy uh, in the mill, or is it just simply the blending that's going to be done? And then secondly, the 110 million of capital, Rick, uh, does that include the pre-strip? And you might yet have an idea what that might be. Uh, so yeah, uh, just to answer your, your second question first, yeah, that, that does include the pre-strip. Um, there's, um, there's not a lot of pre-strip, to be honest with you. Um, because the ore comes right up to the surface, uh, but you're kind of doing an aggressive uh, uh, stripping campaign while you're mining ore, um, just because the, the the North Peak ore body really comes right to the surface. Actually, both ore bodies come right to the surface, but uh, we'll be mining the North Peak deposit first, and then uh, and then moving over to the main peak uh, or uh, main deposit. Um, in terms of uh, um, Let's see, what was your second question? Or your first question, I guess. Oh, it was just, uh, it was uh, really about the uh, metallurgy, putting a scar oh, in, right. in, into the Kinross mill. And my, my uh, you know, the question is, I would think it would be minor because it's such a big mill and they've got so much to blend anyway. Yeah, and I, I think that's exactly the, the answer. I mean, just to put it in perspective, on average, uh, Kinross is mining and putting about 10 million tons of Fort Knox ore through the mill per year. Uh, it varies. It's varied from sort of eight and a half to 11, uh, 11, 11 and a half, I think, something in that neighborhood. So 10 is not a bad, you know, sort of broad estimate. Um, and uh, and then uh, so we'll be mining roughly one million tons, so about one tenth of the Fort Knox uh, throughput. Now, our grade is going to be six grams gold equivalent, whereas the Fort Knox grade is about 0.6. So we have got 10 times uh, 10 times the grade. One tenth the tons. Uh, the two sides of the mill, if you will, and the mill actually is set up as, uh, as a big sag mill, and then a uh, two two lines of of mills that go into the leach tanks. Uh, as I understand it, one side of the mill um, uh, will be used for the Fort Knox ore, and the other side of the ore will be uh, used for peak gold ore, so they can uh, be blended there, or I should say, so Mancho ore. Still, still having trouble getting used to the new name. Um, so, uh, but and to answer your question about copper, uh, it is basically um, not an issue. And I've asked this question, you know, a dozen times about both uh, from a, a metallurgical standpoint in the mill, in the plant side of the operation, but also in the tailings facility. And uh, basically, because we're a relatively small amount of ore with a, a huge amount of uh, 
not only from the milling standpoint, you know, sort of a 10 to one ratio, but in the tailings facility, which is, you know, more where my long-term concern uh, would be, um, you're, you're talking about, you know, literally hundreds of millions of tons of material that's in that uh, tailings facility already. So um, the short answer is no, I've, I've asked the question many times um, and, uh, and uh, they're, they're highly confident, Kinross is highly confident that the mill uh, will be able to treat the ore and that the tailings facility will be able to store the, uh, the tailings uh, over the long term. Good. Well, thank you very much, Rick. Appreciate those. Good question, so. Thank you very much. Uh, Stephen Shipman, do you have any questions today? If so, can you unmute yourself? Uh, I don't. Thank you. All my questions have been answered. Thank you. Oh, great. Uh, Scott, do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, we do. Uh, first question is, is there going to be any pre-sorting of the ore before you truck it to Fort Knox? That's a good question. And uh, we are, um, uh, one aspect of the uh, scoping study was to identify ore sorting as a potential technology to use. So that work is ongoing right now. We don't have an answer uh, out of that yet. Um, and obviously it would be to sort waste material out. Um, so uh, we'll take a look at that. Um, it is a relatively, uh, well, not, a, not a super new technology, but um, we, we're seeing more and more uh, companies look at ore sorting technology. Uh, where historically it seems to have worked the best is in low grade deposits, not high grade deposits. Um, but uh, but it's a it's a it's a new field. It's rapidly developing. Uh, the machines are getting more and more efficient. The software is getting more and more effective. I guess I should say. And uh, so I, I think it's uh, it's certainly um, an area of development uh, that uh, the mining industry is starting to take uh, take advantage of. Uh, we are doing the studies here on the peak gold, uh, sorry, the Mancho ore and uh, we'll be reporting uh, probably uh, when we, uh, if we decide to go forward with it, it will be in the feasibility study. Thank you. And a couple questions grouped together about the road and the year. I'm gonna just use this one as a summary. You have winter drilling, but during mining, how much of the year will you be able to mine and truck? Uh, this is a year round operation. So uh, contrary to maybe popular belief or understanding, it's actually easier to mine in the wintertime than, uh, than in the spring and the fall when you have a lot of rain and a lot of water moving around. Water is the, the, the biggest concern for any mining operation, uh, controlling the water, controlling the runoff, uh, and it's just hard on equipment. Um, you know, the mud and the, uh, that just uh, causes uh, a lot of headaches with uh, big, big uh, haul trucks. Um, so from that aspect, it's actually easier to mine in the wintertime. You got to keep, keep people warm and safe, but that's uh, that's not really hard with uh, with, uh, with, the, with the equipment fleets that we have and operate the, now at Modern Mines. Um, so this is a uh, year-round operation, um, year-round mining, and year-round uh, hauling on the road. Um, Obviously, we'll, we'll plan to have some weather days uh, for truck hauling. Uh, you know, if we've got a, a storm, uh, blizzard type conditions, we'll probably just not haul that day. Uh, we've got extra uh, stockpile storage capacity built into the, uh, the, the Mancho mine site. Um, so we've, you know, we've got some, um, you know, sort of a caliber there to be able to, if we're, if we're um, have a storm for a couple of days and it takes, uh, we don't have two or three days of trucking, we won't have any issues there. Um, Alaska is pretty well set up to handle winter storms. So, you know, when they do hit, the Department of Transportation is out there clearing the highways. And of course, we'll, uh, you know, we're not going to operate during a storm. We'll probably just uh, <coughs> shut the trucking down. Um, mining operations tend not to shut down too frequently. Um, so uh, I think most of, uh, you know, from a mining standpoint, storm might interrupt things for a little bit here and there, but uh, nothing of consequence. Great, and a little follow-up question on that. Uh, what is the load limit on the highway? Uh, it's a standard 40-ton uh, truck, so uh, that's a single uh, single truck, so we'll have a, a truck and a trailer. Um, so I think that weight is 60, if I remember right. Okay, and uh, I believe you answered this already, but somebody had a question. 
clarifying six grams per ton or four grams? I think you said six, is that correct? Yeah, so what's gonna be trucked to the mill is six grams gold equivalent. So that's the gold plus the silver. Um, the resource uh, is 4.2 grams per ton gold. And then the silver, silver we, we do, uh, we categorize that separately. Uh, I think it's in the chart there. If I can, oh, maybe I can't, guess I can't call it back here, but uh, uh, yeah, it's in, uh, one's a resource grade and one's a mine grade. So you, you're you basically sort of high grading as a deposit, if you will. We have 1.3 million ounces in all three categories uh, measured, indicated, inferred. Uh, sorry, no, it's just measured and in, indicated. So if you take uh, sort of a subset of that, use a higher internal cutoff, and that's to account for the 1.3 grams per ton trucking costs, uh, then you end up with about a, uh, a six gram gold equivalent grade that will be trucking to the Fort Knox mill. Thanks for that presentation. Uh, next question, can you please provide an update on the Eagle Hona exploration with some details on what your exploration plans are right now? Is there any reason why the exploration got pushed back until now, originally expected in June? What are you looking to see get out of this year's exploration work on these lands? Yeah, so um, actually our program is ongoing right now. We started at Shamrock, uh, it's lower elevation. So uh, uh, the June startup was, uh, we're out there right now. So um, at Eagle, we're up higher at Eagle. Uh, contrary to uh, uh, Peak and Mancho area, uh, Mancho is kind of in the low rolling Ketlin Hills. So your elevations, you know, uh, top of the hills there are around a little over 2,000, 2,300 feet. Eagle is a lot steeper country. You're at the top of the mountains there are about uh, 6,000 feet. So we get a later start there because of that. And so we're starting in mid-July, um, which is not that far away. It's just a little over a week now. Um, so we'll, uh, at, um, at Eagle, um, we've got a team of uh, half a dozen geologists who will be out uh, getting boots on the ground, just doing a lot of follow-up sampling. Each one of those creeks or six kilometers long strike had anomalous gold and silver and, and copper in them. Um, and so we're basically uh, walking up those creeks into the, into the uh, tops of the uh, upper reaches of the creeks and then the, in the uh, top, tops of the mountains there and doing a lot of, um, a lot of sampling. Uh, it's, it's kind of your basic prospecting, boots on the ground prospecting. Um, uh, I'll get out there uh, in July, when we when we start that program up, uh, I'll be second third week of July. I'll be out there myself, and um, uh, I'm I'm looking forward to getting uh, getting myself out there. I've never been out to the area, as I mentioned. Uh, that was part of the program that was done. Geez, I think it was in 2015 or 14, quite a while ago. Uh, they did a broad stream sediment and uh, pan concentrate sampling program all across the the northern part of the uh, uh, the Tetlin lease and then the claims that uh, originally were in the joint venture with with Royal Gold. So it was part of a big broad program, and it was surprising how uh, how much high quality data came out of that program that um, unfortunately didn't get followed up. And the only reason why it didn't get followed up was you know time and resources. Um, they either had too much going on at peak uh, dollar wise that they decided to spend more money drilling more holes at peak, which I think was probably in, in hindsight the wise decision. If you know, find a nice ore body, uh, that's always a good place to start. Um, and uh, they made a decision to, to do more follow-up work at Hona over peak. I, I don't know what the history of that was. I think somebody probably might have just been, you know, weather that they could get out to Hona on that particular day, like what they saw and, and did some, uh, did more follow-up work on Hona rather than going over the top of the ridge and, and going on to the Eagle side, which is, um, yeah, looks looks very prospective. So um, our objective, again, get uh, boots on the ground out there. Uh, we'll start up at the work at Eagle in mid-July here. And uh, as I mentioned, we're already starting our exploration work at uh, Shamrock. That's ongoing right now. Most of what we have planned for Shamrock is uh, soil grid, uh, extending the soil grids, and uh, getting some trenching done on some of the higher um, higher quality areas. That, that work will take place probably later in, uh, in July and August. Thank you. And a follow-up to that question from the same investor. Can you please provide some more color on why exploration budget, 
budget was increased at the Men Cho deposit? Was it due to some early success this year with the drill bit that led to this increased budget? Uh, it was a couple of things. One was we wanted to do more exploration, um, mm -hmm. um, more more dollars towards exploration. Uh, about two hundred thousand additional uh, direct drilling costs related to that. Um, and um, and then the other part of it uh, was environmental um, environmental studies um, that would support our uh, uh, permit application uh, for to the Corps of Engineers uh, for the 404 permit. So that was those two areas that were made up the, the lion's share of the of the increased budget from 18 to 18.7, and that was just recently approved uh, about two weeks ago. Thank you very much. Uh, another question. You have few outstanding shares. Is there any discussion on issuing more shares to increase liquidity? Yeah, so, um, yeah, and thanks for the question because I, I failed to mention uh, on our uh, corporate slide that uh, we have, uh, we're in the process of applying to uh, uplist to the uh, New York Stock Exchange American listing or what used to be called the Amex and it's gone through a few name changes, but it's now we're being reestablished as the uh, uh, NYC American. Um, we're working on another transaction that we hope to have wrapped up here in a, within uh, several weeks. Once that's done, then we'll put our application into uh, uh, to the NYC and the SEC. Um, they're, uh, they'll have a go through a review process, um, and then hopefully, in sometime in September, we'll be. Uh, uh, looking at uplisting in uh, on the NYSC, and along with that, we do probably plan we do plan to do a um, an, uh, a broad based uh, equity issue because it'll, it'll be effectively a re IPO. In fact, that's how the SEC really uh, views this. When you uh, upgrade from an OTC type listing to a New York Stock Exchange listing, they see it as a re IPO. Um, so that's a that's a process that we'll plan to do here. Uh, hopefully, effectively. Effective in another uh, within another month, um, it'll have it'll go through a review process, and then hopefully uh, by the fall time we'll be uh, trading on the NYSE America, which I think is a a much more uh, functional exchange than the OTCQB. Uh, no no offense to my uh, uh, the folks at the uh, uh, of the OTC, but uh, all the other companies we've uh, worked with that we've started. Uh, whether it be Nova Gold or Trilogy or Alexco, they've all been listed on the uh, on the NYC American, and we find that to be a really effective and efficient uh, exchange. So we'll look forward to that uh, that process. But and um, just to emphasize that when we are uplisted, we will look at uh, doing another uh, another modest share and uh, share issuance uh, to get broad distribution out to uh, to the public markets. Thank you. And a final question from the audience. Um, environmental permitting is Q4 2021. Permitting and construction is 2022. What are the other hurdles to getting biting to start by 2024? Are you confident that ore will be shipped in 2024? Yeah, I, I am today. We haven't seen uh, uh, in our internal reviews and internal studies, we haven't seen anything uh, that would uh, tell us otherwise. Uh, no red flags that have come up, uh, you know, and kind of goes back to the, up on the technical side from, you know, metallurgy to uh, uh, our ability to, to mine the deposit and, and uh, to mine it safely and, and uh, effectively. Uh, trucking costs, as I said, they're, they're kind of, you know, we went through a big downturn in, uh, during the whole COVID year with uh, oil prices. Oil prices have kind of come back to uh, um, I don't know whether they're stabilized there, but um, they certainly come back to comparable to where they were where they were when Kinross did their original study, um, and you know came up with the 750 all-in sustaining costs. So, um, uh, I think in terms of from a permitting standpoint, again we're we're not permitting very much. We're only the, the permit we need from the federal government is to basically upgrade an existing road. Um, which will only help the Tetland Village. Um, right now that road gets impassable in the spring runoff season from uh, April through June. It's often uh, uh, can be flooded and you have to do work to, to get uh, the, the drainage to go where it's supposed to go. 
that'll be all part of our plan to uh, to make that road year round accessible. Um, and obviously that that goes up to our, our our mine site, or we use part of that road to get up to our mine site. So um, we don't really see any permitting issues with that. It's, you know, there is a permitting process you go through, but I don't, you know, I don't see it as uh, as controversial at all. Um, and we just don't need very many other permits. Uh, we're working on private land. Um, you know, we'll have a stormwater uh, uh, prevention plan. That's, that's sort of typical of any mining operation. Um, and it's technically a, a permit, you know, but it's, it's basically your plan to, to control water uh, so you don't have water running where it's not supposed to. Um, um, we'll have a, a small uh, uh, power production at, uh, at site. Uh, you know, but they, that's basically to keep people warm in the uh, in the uh, offices and the and at the mine at the uh, at the campsite uh, where we're actually be plugging into um, the local grid for our for our campsite. Um, one other thing I think I forgot to mention is uh, we have made a decision not to crush the ore at uh, at uh, Mancho. Uh, we'll be delivering whole ore. Uh, run of mine or into the trucks, the highway trucks and trucking that up to the Fort Knox facility. We'll be crushing it at Fort Knox, uh, which reduces our amount of power that we would need down at the mine site by, by about half. It's, uh, we hardly use any power now at the mine site. And that's because power is cheaper at Fort Knox than it would be at Mancho. Um, we're, we're plugged at Fort Knox, we're plugged into the grid and uh, we've got some of the uh, cheaper power in the state of Alaska as a, as a result of that. So, um, yeah, I really don't see um, uh, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of issues to that we have to get through. Um, it's just time we've got to execute on uh, on all the things that we've uh, been talking about and outlining. Um, I do I do see us, and we just had a joint venture meeting and discussed the, the, the plan to submit the permits uh, sometime in Keith four of this year. So uh, I'd say sometime after September, you'll start to see, uh, you should, we should see a formal application go into the Corps of Engineers. Uh, and that's really the, the main permit and the other permits, uh, again, are all issued by the state of Alaska, but there, there are very few of those uh, that we'll need. And none of them are confidential. Thank you so much for that. Um, I had one final question from the audience that just came in, which was a follow-up to your NYSE listing. What is the projected size of the offering associated with the uplisting? Well, we we, have, we can't comment on that at this time. Uh, we've got to, you know, just get our paperwork in order, get our applications in, and uh, you know, we'll uh, we'll take a look at that um, when we when we're out the other side of this. Um, there, there's no sense in trying to try to preempt that and and. Uh, and uh, at this time, at least, it, you know, we don't need a lot of money. So, you know, it's not gonna be a big financing. Uh, we've got $36 million in the bank. We just really wanna get more more eyes on the story and, and uh, it'll be, you know, sort of part of the IPO, re-IPO process, if you will. Understood. And I wanna thank everyone for sending in questions. If you have any additional questions for Rick, please send them to us. We'll make sure that we get them to him and get them answered for you. And with that, Doug, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Well, thanks. Uh, um, appreciate the, uh, the the questions and uh, appreciate the attention today. I'm happy to uh, answer any questions by email, uh, as uh, as Doug said. So uh, uh, I'll look forward to receiving those and uh, have a great day and uh, uh, happy investing to you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Rick. Thank you everybody for coming.